So, hello everybody. Welcome to another free episode of a YouTube mixing tutorial. And this time it's about physical integrity. Are you having problems to get your mix sounding big? To get your mix sound lush? And to get your mix on a quality level that it easily can compete with any mix that is played on the radio? If yes, then you don't manage physical integrity at the moment. So stay tuned, look this tutorial, I'll teach you a lot about this thing. Let's hear some examples. So I prepared three examples. The first one is a pop mix. It was uh, once mixed in the box by another engineer. And then there was another mix done by me because the client thought that the original mix would sound too small. Let's start with the mix that the client was not happy with. And then after two bars, I switch to my mix. So I guess the difference is quite clear. Uh, the small mix indeed is small. It sounds boxy, it doesn't have punch. The snare is not big sounding. The bass is not really there. And in the other mix, there is a, a big sound, a lush sound, a wide sound. Another example in the domain of uh, acoustic music. Let's start with a mix that I did for Yasmin Tabatabai, producer was David Klein. <laughs> And let's hear something similar, another jazz production by a very good piano player, Hungarian piano player. It was a recorded mix in a, a good studio. I'm not uh, telling which one it is, but a professional studio. That's the result. Now you could say that it's different music and in my mix there was string, there was a trumpet and so on. Well, yeah, okay, true. So let's hear the same piano player with a very similar band, bass, drum and piano. Uh, but now let's hear again this mix coming from an international good studio and then let's hear a similar production mixed by me. you hear that that one here sounds boxy, that on that one here the snare sounds little, the bass sounds little. Let's hear it again. While on my mix, I guess the snare sounds a lot bigger, you can hear that the bass actually had some size and the piano had some size. Let's hear it again. Actually, one of the best tests that you can make if your mix is big enough is that you just turn down the level of your mix. I turn both mixes now down by about 8 dB 
Now you listen to the music at a very low level. Don't turn up the level of your speaker system. You listen to your mix at a low level and at the same time you speak. So if I listen to this mix and I speak at the same time, I guess you will really have a problem to follow the snare. You might be able to follow the piano because this is the loudest thing. However, you don't hear the sustain of the notes in the piano. You don't really hear the hi-hat, you don't really hear the snare, you have problems to hear the bass. While, however, if you switch to my mix, I think you still can hear the bass, you still can hear the sustains of the piano, and you still can hear the snare if it plays. And that's actually a brilliant test. Listen to your mix at a soft level. Talk alone or talk with somebody. And then listen, and if you can follow every musical element that happens in the mix while you are speaking, then that's a very good sign that your mix is good. So, let's now go to the theoretical stuff. The understanding on how you should uh, deal with dynamics is often understood wrong. Very often I hear comments like, oh yeah, musical dynamics, that is what we should keep. However, uh, if you keep it, then your mix will sound probably small. Let me uh, show this uh, with some graphics. Let's say that this, what you see here, would be a tone, a snare tone or a piano tone live in the room. That here would be the, uh, the loudest level uh, before you have pain. So at the concert, a really loud tone. And then here you would see the harmonics. Obviously, uh, the higher the harmonics, the softer they are. However, live in the original room, you still can hear everything. You hear the harmonics up to the highest frequencies. And you also have to understand that uh, the nice parts of a sound often are in the high harmonics. And what is interesting is in the high harmonics. It's extremely important that we hear the high harmonics in a mix. But what happens if you listen to the music at home? The most important thing about understanding dynamics and how to deal with dynamic in a mix is to understand that we give the control of the final level that somebody listens your mix at home. This control is given to the listener. If the listener puts a CD in, what is the next step that he does? The next step is he grabs the volume button and he makes the volume so that it's comfortable for him. And this volume might be way lower than you as a mix engineer would wish it was. However, that's a matter of fact. The volume is chosen by the listener and it can be very low. So what happens? Let's first see um, the dynamic range at home. At home, you cannot listen as loud as at the concert. Never ever. Even in a studio, if you listen very loud, it will be softer than at your home. Home max is, uh, let's say, it's somewhere here. You also have to understand that the minimal level that you can hear at home is higher than at a very good concert room, because there is maybe a fridge that makes some noise. You might hear birds from the outside. You will hear cars from the outside. You might have childs, then uh, they make some noises. So let's say the minimal level of what you can hear at home is here, this green line. The maximum level is about here. That's still quite a big dynamic range. In fact, in a car or uh, yeah, it might even be smaller. What happens at home? Now the listener chooses to bring the volume down. And what will happen is then this. He will bring the volume down so that the loudest part of the music is comfortable for him. If you don't handle dynamics well, all harmonics won't be heard. There is really no chance that those harmonics that are down here could be heard at all. So let's simplify this. Now, uh, yeah, let's make this very clear. All this that is grayed out now is not heard at home if the mix has not a great dynamic range. Simply not there. That is what you hear on a bad mix. That's really only very little part of what originally was there. That would be a very little sounding mix, but 
Moreover, in jazz, that's very often what you finally really hear. And then it's very clear that the snare is not that big, but it's that big. And a grand piano is not that big, but it's only so small. That's not how it should be. So basically, all this is gone. All this is still here. It's not how it should be. How it should be is like this. You have to bring all harmonics, all harmonics in the range where you actually can hear it at your home or at the listener's home. That's the most important thing. If you manage to bring everything in this part, however, it still must sound dynamic. We don't want that we hear uh, basically a mix that doesn't pump anymore, that doesn't have punch. So that's, uh, that's actually a very difficult task. If you manage to bring everything in this little window, but your mix still sounds punchy and still has a lot of life, then actually you succeed. Then your mix sounds great. So uh, what do you have to do as the mix or as the recording engineer to actually get dynamic range right? so that every harmonics can be heard. Let's do this real quick because it already starts at the recording. If you have tube microphones, just as an example, tube microphones, they saturate a little bit. What does saturation mean? So actually, if this is the first harmonic, saturation actually means that you will produce new harmonics. Maybe here, maybe here, it's even louder. Maybe here, here, and so on and so on. However, those harmonics, they won't be that low as it's here because you already have a harmonic from the instrument. So actually, and that's at least my impression, the harmonics comes on top of it. It's basically to record with good microphones. And I like to have tube microphones very often, just exactly because of that reason, the dynamic range is different on a tube microphone. The dynamic range is a little bit smaller, however, it sounds as if it would be bigger. And this is exactly what we want. So what we have with a tube microphone is our harmonics are higher compared to the first harmonic. Now, a lot of old recordings don't have problems with the dynamic range, which is quite interesting. Why is it? What was different about old recordings? Tube microphones? Okay, we can have tube microphones today too. However, what was different was the tape. And the tape, again, was something that basically made the dynamic range, physically speaking, more little. However, uh, if you hear the music, it even sounds bigger. So what happens with the tape? Again, the same thing. It adds just a little bit the harmonic content. I know it doesn't really look extremely beautiful. Uh, however, uh, I think it's understandable. So again, more harmonics. Now the rest has to come while mixing. And it's mostly uh, with the use of compression that you can handle dynamic, obviously. But uh, it's not so easy to set up the compressors at the right or in the right way. And this is uh, what we will teach in this tutorial. So finally, if you mix it, then again, there will come all the rest of the thing. We will again make this thing here more little. Uh, we will again make some harmonics. And now you see you're almost there and the rest comes by mastering, as you know, you would just maybe cut the loudest peaks a little bit and then it's uh, very clear that all those harmonics are then basically up. And then you're there. So that's the difficult task about it, but that is how um, it has to be done. Now, if you have a modern recording that has not seen tube microphones, and obviously our recordings don't see tapes, even in our studio, although we have tape, we usually don't use them because uh, it's uh, it's not so easy to work with tapes. You cannot make all the edits that uh, today's musician want. So then you have to do more in mixing, maybe with uh, riding faders. 
or maybe you have to use the compressors more. But the more you have to use compressors, the better you have to understand them. Otherwise, the mix is not sounding good. So let's go on. Okay, so now we hear the drum part of the pop mix I showed you as the first example. Let's first hear it with all dynamics in uh, and also with all saturation plugins in because to increase overtones or harmonics you can use compressors or you could also use saturation plugins. There are some digital plugins and we have some analog output. That's with everything engaged. Now let's hear with everything bypassed. Let's now go more into the details. Uh, first of all, let's hear it without the uh, yeah. Let's hear it without the analog outboard. I switch it off after about two bars. Okay, so um, let's keep the analog inserts out and let's now um, bypass the bus compressor because at the moment we are using this unfair child compressor as the drum bus compressor. Again, with for two bars and then I switch it out. As you can see, the drum bus compressor is actually doing quite a lot. If you don't have an analog compressor, you can do almost the same thing in the box. That uh, would be no problem. We'll look about this later. Let's now um, switch the Pro Tools dynamics in and out to see what that one is doing. And as you can hear, in this mix, the plugins are not doing so much. That's because I mainly mixed it analog. So the uh, change with and without the analog compressors is uh, obviously better. OK, so what we are doing now, we go through these tracks. I switched all the analog compressors out. Uh, the mastering, uh, the bus compressor is out too. So basically, we have the drum without any dynamics. And I'll explain you how you could do this dynamic range controlling in the box. So that was the drum without any dynamics. And you can clearly see that wouldn't work. Well, let's make the test. I told you before, I talk and at the same time we hear the drum. And if you hear now my talking and the drum, it will be very difficult to follow the drum. So let's go on. Let's start with, why not start with the snare? Let's add some compression. So if you are not familiar with compressors, it's actually a very good idea to use emulation from analog hardware. Like this CLA 76 by Waves, you could use it from Universal Audio or it really doesn't matter so much which uh, manufacturer you choose. The reason why you should use this, if you are not familiar with compressors, it's very easy. There is an input, there is an output, there is an attack speed, there is a release speed, and there are four different uh, ratio presets. So it's very easy. You cannot really do something wrong. Um, so let's play it back. 
And actually a quite good rule is if you don't change the setting, this thing shows up, at least with the waves, then it already should compress a little bit. If it would not compress, it's an indication that your signal is too soft in volume. And although in a digital audio workstation, it might not be so much a problem like if you mix on an analog desk, but still most plugins sound best if they uh, become a decent level. So if you insert this plugin with its basic settings and the needle is doing like this, then you know, okay, it's recorded right. It's quite a loud snare actually in the DAW. And so you can start right away. The more input you give, the more compression you have because the threshold in this unit is fixed. So if you go down with the input and then to compensate, you have to go up with the output, you will have less compression. See, if you go up with the input, you have to go down a little bit to compensate. You have a lot of compression. So let's find a decent amount. Then there are a lot of rules about what should you do with the release and what you should do with the attack. Uh, one rule says attack should be very slow and the release should be very fast on a, com on a snare compressor. Well, that's a there are no rules. Um, well, it's actually not so bad if you do it like this, because then it's nice and snappy, but it doesn't mean that it always should be like this. You could also be slower and compress a little bit less. Usually that's a more gorgeous sounding snare, while, however, if you choose to be fast, then it's a more snappy, a more pungy snare. Finally, you only have to, to listen in the entire mix. And that's, by the way, if you're learning to deal with, with everything in this thing, with compressors, with EQs, the problem is you have to be in solo mode, otherwise you don't hear the difference. However, um, once you have learned everything, you don't have to be in the solo mode anymore because it's actually uh, it's actually how it is in the mix. Bypassed, engaged. Let's try to have about the same level if you're comparing. The level can anyway not be totally uh, totally the same because uh, if you are compressing, you're changing dynamics, but let's just look that it's not too loud if the compressor is in. What is the ratio? Ratio means that it will compress more. However, if it compresses more, it would mean that the needle of the compressor should go down more. Now look what happens if I change the ratio. As you can clearly see, it doesn't compress more. Why doesn't it compress more if the ratio is higher? Well, uh, it's quite simple, because this here is not only the ratio, it's also a threshold preset. That's quite clever. So the more you compress, actually the higher the threshold is. So actually you get always the same amount of compression, however, it gets more aggressive. Very often for a snare drum or a bass drum, more aggression is better. Let's compress a little bit more so that it better can be heard what it is doing. And the difference is not so big, but it's there. It's usually uh, bigger on the real analog compressor that we have in the rack. 
Uh, that's just a matter of fact, but still it's quite a bit of a compression. You also see there is an all button. That was a trick on the real 1167. You could engage all buttons and then it would uh, have changed some things internally. And it usually results in a very aggressive and a very fast compression that I would not use for a single snare, but maybe if you do parallel compression, you could do it. Let's hear it quickly. Back to 12. and so on. Okay, then uh, it's absolutely not forbidden to use uh, a second compressor to just give you a little bit more crunch. Um, so for that thing, we could use the um, LR2A. Let's stick at one manufacturer at the moment. And that's often quite a good idea. You have a first compressor, maybe his the compressor is fast, and then you have a second compressor, a little bit slower. Also choose a compressor that gives a little bit high frequency content, which always is helping. And then to finally get some more harmonics, why not have a saturation plugin? Why not try it with the decapitator? So you see, that gives a nice aggressive sound. My trick is usually I go with the drive to a level where I clearly can hear it, where it clearly does something. And then I go back uh, with the effect by uh, feeding a little bit the dry signal back in. Let's hear it all together, all three plugins together. And as you can hear, if you hear all plugins together, bypassed and engaged, the difference is actually, I think at least it is bigger than what you would have thought it might be by having heard the single plugins in and out. And that's usually an important thing in mixing. You do a lot of little things, but to Together, it has a big effect. And usually, at least this is my opinion and my taste, it's better than having one or two plugins that do a lot because all those plugins that emulate a hardware, let me tell you, they sound closer to the original hardware if you don't do too much. However, if you try to go to the maximum, if you really try to get 10 dB reduction with this 76, there you will feel the difference with the analog one because the analog or the original 1167 can do easily 10 dBs and it still sounds punchy and slappy while the plugin cannot. That's the difference. And this difference is not really a problem because you can have a lot of plugins in Siri and the signal, uh, the sound quality uh, won't get worse because if you have a lot of analog gear in Siri, you might get noise and distortion. You don't get that with plugins. Uh, to final up this snare, let's uh, engage a little EQ, just because we have a little bit less uh, highs than we had on the analog mix, which might be the desk or which might be the real output. So let's just real quick give some overtones with the EQ. Um, Let's again, by the way, with this emulating equalizers, you also get overtones because even if you switch everything here out, if you add a little bit of this preamp simulation and if you add a little bit drive by making the input higher and the output lower, It's again a difference in color, and that's only because the harmonics are changing. Let's hear it with the EQ.
all together bypassed. In. Now, of course, we have uh, gotten louder as always. Usually, if you mix, if you set up plugins, the result is always louder. So often, it's a good idea to just go a little bit down again, just until it's as loud. Go again a little bit down. Okay. And exaggerate, because even if this might sound overprocessed in solo mode, I guarantee you it's not overprocessed. It's probably even underprocessed. If you hear that snare in the entire mix, probably we even will need more compression or parallel compression or bus compression, because finally it needs to, comp to compete with all the other instrument. Let's now real quick do the same thing for the bass drum. Okay, that's the bass drum. Let's add compression. With the bass drum, it's important. Usually, you should not be totally fast with the release. Although this is teached in a lot of uh, lessons, but um, if it's only snappy, you don't have the tone. I feel that it's thicker sounding if the release is a little bit slower. Let's see. Let's see how far we can go. Okay. A little bit less. Let's at this stage add saturation. Let's do the same thing like before, real quick. A little bit decapitator. Let's quickly check the presets. Which one is? The E here often has uh, the most high, while the T often sounds a little bit more thick. Let's add a second compressor as before. Why not the GAN, the 2A? Let's add a little bit kick. Why not again with the Shapes plugin? Let's make a little bit saturation again. Maybe let's give a little bit low end. Let's hear everything together in bypass. In. Maybe let's make it a little bit faster here, a little bit slower here, a little bit less so that we have more snap. With the snare. Without compression, with. Let's go real quick to the overheads. And there you can see how it sounds without compression. It was recorded in a professional studio, uh, however, the room was not huge, and that's how a drum sounds in a small room. Boxy. Let's do some compression. We have to do some EQing here because it's really without the analog sound, it's just too boxy. Here is the boxiness. Let's give a little bit warmth. Um, let's add a second compressor. Why not again the same thing? Let's add a little bit decapitator. Mm. 
let's try to give a little bit more excitement. Why not again with the ships just to... I feel on a lot of mixings uh, you see that overhead actually all bass energy gets cut away. I think on these recordings, on this recording we should do the opposite. Should give a little bit of something here. Without. With might be better. Let's hear it with and without for all the tracks that we did. Now, of course, the bus compressing has to come. Uh, I quickly put that thing back. That is now the analog thing here, but uh, you can do more or less the same thing with a plugin. White. And as you can see, this uh, is actually doing a lot. Let's real quick put it out and see uh, what we can do with a plugin. And as you can see, the behavior is quite similar. It does more or less the same. However, as you would expect, uh, hopefully for a such expensive analog output gear, there is more life and more punch in it. But it's not that if you wouldn't have the analog hardware, it would be any problem doing that effect of, uh, with a plugin. So let's come to an end to this little uh, YouTube tutorial. Compression is really important in order to get a big sound. Let's hear the entire mix here with this new drum sound. The drum and the mix won't perfectly match, obviously, but still, um, let's hear that drum that we just mixed with the mix and then I switch off the drum plugins and then hopefully the drum will sound much more little. Let's see. Hey, it really matters what you do and even what you say. It really matters if you leave or if you gonna stay It really matters if you keep on doing things your way It really matters if you say okay or if you just don't care And I think you clearly heard it without the dynamics Everything sounds little, everything sounds small Because every instrument has to fight against all the other instruments Finally, all you have is two speakers and two speakers is less than a real band at the real stage. So you have to do something in order to give strength, in order to give size. And this is one part of the important stuff in mixing is getting the dynamic right. Let's just for fun make a comparison with graphics or with visuals. Let's say you would be in the cinema, that's what you see more or less. Here are cinema and the audience, and this is basically the lady showed in the film. Now uh, the film has to be also watched at home, and at home the screen is much more little. Now if the visual guys would say, okay, we have to keep the dynamics, let's not change the dynamic. What would be the result at home? Result would actually at home be that you only see the eye. Because now on the screen, the eye was maybe 70 centimeters wide on the big screen. And now you want to keep those 70 centimeters. But then you don't see the entire picture. The screen at home is smaller. So actually everything that had place on the big screen now must fit on the little screen. That's exactly what I teach about dynamics here. If this is the live dynamics, this dynamics doesn't come at home. The stage doesn't come at home. It's impossible. At home, the dynamic is more little. So everything that was in the music, 
every harmonic, every little detail must now be in that range. And that's really extremely important. So this was the little uh, comparison with visual. I know it's not totally right, but uh, maybe gives you a better understanding about why we have to get the dynamic range under control. Okay, so this was it. My last free YouTube tutorial. I hope it was useful to you. Uh, if you want, go to my website, danieldetweiler.com. Uh, subscribe there, because in about three or four months, we will release a complete audio tutorial about 20 hours long, in which we teach this physical integrity and dynamics in detail. We teach getting dimension in detail, getting the spectral balance right, and how to generally get a great mix. This will be a paid tutorial then, but it won't be expensive. Uh, sign up at my homepage for the newsletter and yeah, you will get all the information. So thanks for watching. Bye.